A pleasant good evening to NTA political leader Gary Griffith. Hi, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Griffith. As always, a pleasure to have you on. I know so much is going on, of course, with you. Uh, tomorrow as well is, is a big meeting, but we'll touch on that. But first of all, uh, you know, everyone's talking about security. This special Sunday uh, meeting of the National Security Council that's headed by Dr. Rowley. Um, basically, we're asking what, what is different here? Because first of all, more boots on the ground. Been there. Further use of technology in gathering intelligence. We were told as a nation that the authorities know where all the gang members are. All the people that are disrupting our society, they know where they sleep, where they eat, where's their outside woman. And third, coordinated operations in hotspot communities against criminal elements. Been there, done, there, done that. Where are we at now, Mr. Griffin? Well, where are we at? Good evening to you and to your many listeners. Um, it is the same old, same old. You call a meeting, bring in all the heads, and tell them that you think that they're all corrupt, so you need to bring in a vetted unit to deal with them. This man has done nothing to lift the morale and motivation of the protective services. He has failed miserably. The sad thing is he continues to boast that he's the chair of the National Security Council. At 10.17 this morning, this man was on the seventh hole playing golf in Mooka on a, on a Tuesday morning. Kamala Prasad, the sister of at half past four in the morning, was calling me. Working, doing, looking at all sorts of different things. Since half past four, she's, she's on the ball. This man is on the golf course at the seventh hole at 10, 17 a.m. on a work day. He does not know what to do. He is clueless. So you're calling all of these uh, protective services heads to basically tell the country and to tell them, I don't trust you, you are all, all corrupt, so I'm bringing a vetted unit now to monitor you. He has done nothing uh, in, of anything to get out of the box. As it pertains to technology, unbelievable. We were using technology in Trinidad and Tobago. A few moments later, it wasn't by fluke. A few moments later, it was because of the technology that I had that we were able to utilize to, as soon as a kidnapping took place. We were able to pinpoint the kidnappers, know where they are, put a stop to kidnapping, apprehend the kidnappers whilst the victim was still in their, in their, um, in their possession, if you all recall. We put an end to home invasion. We put an evidence that persons who are about to kill someone. We had predictive policing because of the technology. The technology is there. It has not been used. So the audacity of this man to come with nonsense about they intend to use technology and more boots on the ground. More boots on the ground? Turn to Tobago. The time you needed the defense force was when we, during the um, situation with COVID, and we had 150 men coming down into Port of Spain to riot and destroy Port of Spain. They refused to bring one soldier to assist me. And it was the Trinidad Tobago Police Service who stood up and made sure that, that Port of Spain was not destroyed. It was these police officers that stood up throughout COVID. Over 30 officers lost their lives. Not one officer was absent from duty. Every single officer performed above and beyond the call of duty. Not one officer abused their authority. And the man never even once said, thank you, Trinidad Tobago Police, for what you have done. They were the heroes. I will always say they were the heroes during the COVID. Not the five people that he had every Tuesday come, come and do a press conference and tell people, wash your hands and wear a mask and social distancing, and you give them a national award. Right? But that is, that is the, the attitude of this man. He has no respect for the law enforcement agencies. He interferes, and he is totally clueless, and it has been the biggest failure as anyone who was the post of chair of the National Security Council. No, no, I sure you'll agree with me that, you know, as far as payment or more payment to police officers, I personally have no problems with that. I mean, I can understand even when there were reps that came down here from Giuliani's team that you would have invited, made it quite clear, pay the officers, pay them and pay them good. I have absolutely no problem with that. I think the issue here is, is this political hand that seems to be compromising all of our so-called independent agencies when you have this vetting unit, but who do they report to? Is it going to be the very same politician? Who are they going to be taking orders from? I say pay, pay them and pay them well, but it must coincide with as far as performance. The department heads must be held accountable. And so when you say, listen, in this area that is Dima hotspot, in this area that we see an increase or a spike in crime, the heads of the departments have now dealt with it, and these officers need to be rewarded. I have no problem with that. 
Well, it's even the first of this is that he, he's only given higher pay as if, uh, for what I am perceiving, I, I am perceiving is that to those people in the vetting unit. This is going to again affect morale. This is what happened with the special anti-crime unit. So what is the UTT, not SORT. The SAUTT, you handpick specific police officers and soldiers, brought them into sort, uh, and then after you pay them a much higher allowance than the average, than the regular police officer, soldier, and sailor. That affected morale and it caused a division between the police, the defense force, and sort. This is what he is doing again. This is a typical PNM thing. Handpick person closely aligned to you, give, make them your elite unit, and that is what he has been doing all the time. If you want to speak about corruption in the police service, he indirectly has caused this because when I was there, the biggest corruption in police service had to do with overtime. $300 million I was able to cut in overtime corruption. We had a couple hundred police officers came in, they were working 24 hours a day, seven days a week per month, making 70 or 80,000, and it was being signed by others. I put an end to that, cutting over $300 million in overtime corruption. He wants to talk about, about the police. That, when it comes to firearms, the problem with firearm corruption was because of the difficulty the average citizen got to get firearms. So by me making sure that, hey, you don't have to go under the table, you don't have to pay any police officer at the station. If you have everything that is required, we will give it to you. I put an end to the corruption with firearms because, you know, it's supply and demand. Now that it is difficult to get one, people are going to pay now and it's going to, be, it's going to be blackmail and bribery because. So he has now put back the two main elements that caused corruption in the police service because of him interfering in that whole process for the selection of the commissioner of police. And again, going back to the, to the, the vetting process, who is going to vet the vetting officers? Who is going to vet the police officers? So when will it stop? We already have this vetting. We have the special branch. We have the SIU. We have the white collar crime unit. We have... So we have, and we have the SSA that can do vetting for the police. So what he's doing is just making up something in the hope that people will say, ah, he has a plan. His plan is total failure because it makes absolutely no sense. And, and of course, coordinated operations in hotspot communities against criminal elements. The Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force is also ex expected to assist the TTPS. We've had that, that this is nothing new. It isn't, but, um, but again, it is how it is used. When I was Minister of National Security, I can tell you, we utilized the Defense Force, someone was killed in Lavantil, and for 105 days, there was one murder alone in Lavantil, and that was a domestic violence matter. We locked it down, but it is how it is done. Just pumping officers out on the street, out on the, without any process, um, function, intelligent-led policing, predictive policing, all you're going to do is just put it out numbers. It is not going to work. It's like setting, you know what this is? What Rogi is doing is setting feet for bad bowling. You don't set feet for bad bowling because they hit a four, then they're going to put somebody there. That is not how you deal with policing. Effective and predictive policing is anticipating the, the problem, using proper intelligence, the proper technology that we had that he pulled the plug on, and with that, you are now able to utilize your limited national security resources in an effective and efficient manner. Yeah, and, and of course, saying that visibility on the ground was a key part of Sunday's discussions. Yeah, but again, he would not understand that because he shut, they shut down the commissioner's command center, the operational command center, the emergency response patrol, the GPS tracking on the police vehicles. That is why in October 2021, there was a high visibility everywhere you turn you in a police vehicle because we were monitoring every single police vehicle. So just Selling out patrols and then the vehicles could probably just park up by their girlfriend for their shift and then come back out. That's why you're not seeing the vehicles anymore. And it's no fault of the police officers unless you put systems to measure their performance and make them accountable. You're not going to get the police officers operating in that manner. And again, it is all very unfortunate, but it has nothing to do with the officers. It's the same officers that are there that up until August 2021, public trust and confidence was 55%. It's the same officers that were there when it was 14% in 2018, and now it's probably back to 14% now. No fault of the officers, but because of lack of leadership and direction. Uh, Gary, the NTA, I mean, the, the polls have shown, and, and many of these polls, of course, that have a large following, has shown that much in favor for the National Transformation Alliance. I mean, um, the observer was in Digo Martin, and people were telling us outright, listen, we're going with the NTA. Uh, others have been making it quite clear. It's like a breath of fresh air. You have been out and about with your team, interacting, meeting people. Give us an idea of that. I mean, as far as you know, you have grasped the essence on the ground, and what has it been for you and your team? Well, I mean, really, it reminds me so much of I was very young at the time, 
but 1986, not even 2010, 1986, where the whole country just wanted to believe. They wanted change. They said enough was enough. I have walked in the hills in Paramin. I've walked in Lavantil Road, in Steelot, in Duncan Street, Nelson Street, Duke Street, um, up in the hills in Cookerit and Waterhole. I have, uh, just came out of Bagatelle, Diamond Vale, Aruka, Trinity, McCoy, Arima, Point Fountain. Every single place I've gone. You're just hearing the person stating, yes, they were PNM, but they have had it enough is enough. And strange enough, in contrast to Keith Rowley trying to deflect the problem with um, the country, where he says, this is just a local government election. I don't know why they're speaking about crime. Well, guess what? 99% of the country, when, we, when I, I meet them, all they speak about is they are fearful. They want to know what can be done. Would we, if it is, we win the cooperation, would we be able to have a more improved system for security? So again, and it shows the incompetence of Keith Rowley, not understanding local government must involve security. Why do you think the municipal police is under local government? So even that, uh, it shows that his, his lack of understanding. What is also interesting is all these places I just called, they have stated that all of the decades there that they have lived there, not once have they seen the political leader of the PNM in those areas. And those are what you call hardcore PNM areas. So they were shocked to see a political leader in another party going into a PNM stronghold. And that is why the poll, there, there was a poll that was done, the PNM got the poll, and that is why Keith Rowley got his meltdown in St. James a few weeks ago. And he continues to have his meltdown where every single thing he says now is Gary, Gary, Gary. Yeah, and, and this talk about the, the, the list as far as the aldermans or what have you, uh, a lot of that is being bandied about. And if you can give us some clarity on that. Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, again, it is mischievous again, but an individual who had to apologize in public to me for lying. And she just made several lies again, put it into me shutting down and dismantling. So uh, they, 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 they use someone who they've hired as a communication advisor who, is a, who has proven to be a liar. And, and, she, and she continues to, to come with this. So the thing with the Alderman, again, it shows the incompetence of this government. You speak about local government reform. The most simple thing you could have done is to reform the process for people applying to be a candidate. The process was ridiculous. You, you have to get seven other persons who live in the same area. Um, they were they, um, rejecting persons. If you miss a hyphen, they reject someone if it is that you didn't have an A and B term. Um, uh, we had a, a, a justice of the peace put in the 23rd, they put RD in the 23rd, one quarter of an inch over a line. And again, as it pertains to Alderman, how ridiculous can you get? So we go to our river, we only have two candidates, but we had to select six Aldermen because it has to do with, you have to put, because we only can read it that it says you put the number of councillors, right? So we are saying that the number of councillors that you would have put. Uh -uh. So if it is that you have one candidate in Sour um, Lavantil, you have to put, put down 14 older men and only four maximum could be selected. It made no sense. So when we submitted this on the day, it was at half past two, half an hour before the deadline. They said, unless you put down all the names, you just pull up the paper with all the names, it's going to be, we are going to be disqualified. So we were left with no choice just to put names. So the, so the people, the names that were there have no significance. They could never be appointed as older men because we could only get two or three older men in a, in a corporation, if we are lucky. And, and the people that we have, what is making the PNM jealous, is we have people who have been previous attorney generals, previous United Kingdom ambassadors, the previous captain of the National Men's Soka Warriors team, the previous coach of the National Women's Football team, the last person to score a hat trick for Trinidad Tobago in an international football game, Karen Borpest Cummins, the previous number one goalkeeper for the Soka Warriors for 10 years, the previous number one goalkeeper for the National Hockey team for two decades, Two previous PNM councillors, uh, someone who had a uh, previous three time ex tempo champion. The PNM could never dream of that caliber that we have out there. And that is what is bothering them. Yeah. And those are the persons that will be appointed as all the men slash mayors. Uh, quickly, tomorrow, SWWTU Hall. It, it, it's massive. It's taking place tomorrow at 7 p.m. Tell us about it. Well, it's 7, yeah, 7 p.m. on Rison Road, and it will be the first meeting between, uh, held jointly between the UNC and the NT, and it involves um, um, show the, giving the candidates out to show to the public from, from Diego Martin, the 10 in Diego Martin, the 12 in Port of Spain, and the 14 in Sour Love until. Um, 20 of those 36 candidates are from the NT, 16 are from the UNC. So they would all be, um, be coming out for the, for the country to, to see, and all um, the I will be speaking as well as the political leader of the UNC. So it will be a, a team 
and I would uh, ask all of those questions and let us please understand. I know, let me quickly add, there's been a concern by a few, just a few, about the, the unification. Let me go again. Every single time there's a coalition of unified forces, PNM lo will lose an election. Every single time in this country. 1986, 1995, 2010, and 2010 local government. Four out of four. Every single time the, that the PNM uh, goes against the other parties that stand alone, the PNM always wins. Every single time. But once and that government lasted a few months. So, so the math is simple. The data is simple. Do you want Keith Rowley to remain or do you want to send a loud and clear message to him on August 14th? And if you think of that, you have to look at the bigger picture. The, the, the perception of these very few who might be NT and say, well, I, I'm not comfortable with the UNC or vice versa, you're not looking at the bigger picture. This can work. There have been over 80 countries in the world with coalition government, um, present and past, and we have been, and some have worked, some have not. But likewise, governments on their own have worked and many have not. This government has proven to be the biggest failure, and because of a, a one government on their own, it prevents checks and balances, it prevents someone from saying, hey, you're going the wrong way, and it can cause what we are seeing right now, which is known as democratic dictatorship. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Griffin, for taking time out with us. Uh, of course, the link with us here this evening and tomorrow, SWWTU or Rison Road. And uh, we'll be checking in with you periodically. Again, best of luck to you and your entire team and keep up the good work.